Okay, let's get started. So it is now seven o'clock. Um, so we have about seven people here, hopefully uh, uh, eight now. Uh, hopefully more people will uh, tune in as, as the hour progresses. Uh, welcome everyone uh, to our um, weekly Empire uh, Hidden Curriculum Series lecture. Today, uh, we have uh, we have the pleasure of having Dr. Elizabeth Cavalier here with us to talk about um, private practice employment models. Um, once again, you know, with our hidden curriculum series, we were our goal here is to kind of cover the topics uh, in urology that um, are not normally covered um, in residency and in training. So hopefully, uh, this this lecture series helps with that. Um, Dr. Cavalier uh, is part of a uh, total urology care. She founded, um, it's a practice she founded uh, in Manhattan. Um, she's very well versed in the world of private practice. Um, she uh, went to medical school at uh, SUNY Downstate um, and residency at Mount Sinai, and then um, did fellowship uh, at UCLA. And um, she'll, she will uh, talk to us about this topic today. Um, and once again, I want to reiterate that uh, this lecture does uh, give CME credit. So uh, if you are interested in that, uh, please uh, look out for the email um, tomorrow from Michelle uh, pa Paoli. We'll put the uh, link for the survey. In order to get the credit, you have to fill out the survey. So please fill it out. Um, and with that, I will pass it off to Dr. Kevler. Okay. All right. Thank you, Akil. I'm going to share the screen. Okay. Okay. So um, I'm going to talk about private practice models in urology. And before I get into the weeds of private practice, I am going to um, first say that I have no financial relationship with um, anybody having anything to do with this talk, except of course my own practice, but there's no third party compensation. So um, I'm going to just go back a little bit over my background to give you some sort of basis for where my credibility on this subject comes from. So as Akil said, I, start, I did my uh, residency at Mount Sinai. It, it was from 92 to 98. My chairman was Michael Droller. And in my fourth year of residency, I had a baby uh, who's now 25. And I finished in 1998. When I finished, I spent one year as a attending on the faculty at, um, at Mount Sinai before I did my fellowship in 1999 at uh, UCLA with Shlomo Raz. And I finished my fellowship in 2000, which is when I went into practice. So when I started in practice, I came back to New York and I joined a group called New York Urological Associates that was run by John Frackia, who also was the um, chairman of the Department of Lenox Hill, which had a residency of one resident a year, which it still has until now. We now just got approved for a second resident. But he ran the residency program as well as running the private group. So this was a, an, an old school model that actually was not so unusual at the time where the chairman of the department could own his own practice so all the revenue that he generated in clinical medicine went into his private group, and then he did all the administrative work with the practice uh, with the hospital. And it benefited the group because we were able to have sort of like a quasi academic experience where we could have residents in our in our cases. So it was a really nice way for me to start practice. I had no contract when I started. I had just an agreement, a verbal agreement. And I started at $125,000 a year. I was given the opportunity to have um, a practice to build something. And the idea or the plan was that when I reached a certain amount of money that I was bringing in, I would be made a partner. And that was about a million dollars a year. So when I was generating a million dollars a year in revenue, I would be made a partner, which ultimately happened. Um, it took about three years to get there. And at that point, we had property that I would buy into, and that was sort of what solidified the, the partnership. So as, as I bought into the real estate, there were agreements with the real estate, but I actually never had a contract with the partners. 
And the benefit of that was that I had no non-compete, which means I didn't have to sign on to anything and they didn't have to sign on to anything. And within when I started, I was allowed to practice within my fellowship training, which was very important to me. So then in 2015, after 15 years of being with them, for various reasons, I decided to go out on my own. And that's when I opened my own practice, which is called Total Urology Care of New York. So in uh, 2015, I rented out space, 3,000 square feet across the street from Rockefeller Center on 51st and 5th Avenue. I can see St. Patrick's Cathedral out of my window. And I designed and built the space. We now have six exam rooms with a consult room. We are quad A certified, which means we can perform anesthesia in the office. And we do that once a month where we have an anesthesiologist come in and we can do procedures with sedation. We are now um, AIUM certified, which is the American Institute of Ultrasound Medicine. And we have two full-time stenographers who work with me. We have a high complexity CLIA lab for which we do PCR testing in the urine. Um, we own a Mona Lisa touch laser therapy and all of our services, our administrative services are in-house scheduling, billing, HR and marketing. So all of the startup loans have been paid off. The business has no debt. And now we are moving into the sort of second phase of the practice to figure out where we go. Do we remain solo? Do I think about joining another group? Do I think about joining a hospital? What are the options as a solo practitioner for moving forward? And so in my exploration, not only of setting up my own practice, but of also seeing what other opportunities there are, I've become quite familiar with what is going on in the private practice world. So that is my background. So what is it about private practice that seems appealing when you say, what it, you know, why private practice? So the benefits are autonomy, right? Number one is that you're own, your own boss. You can do what you want the way you want. The pace is, a fa is fast and efficient because things are smaller and more nimble. There are fewer politics. There's more freedom and creativity to build within your practice so you can do more things more quickly because you don't have as many people to answer to. Um, outside revenue sources can be explored either with businesses, devices, legal work, um, pharmaceutical relationships. We have the ability um, to market and to promote for ourselves within the practice. Of course, income is our own. Whatever I earn, whatever I produce comes back to me. And then I can take off whatever time I want. I don't necessarily have to run it by anybody or get permission. But there are drawbacks, obviously, to being in private practice, which include the fact that you have to deal with your staff and office. People are sick. They don't show up. They quit. You have to figure out what you're going to do. Overhead has to be covered, and that can be at the expense of profit. First, you pay your creditors. First, you pay your staff, and then you pay yourself. The activities of the daily practice are your problem. The internet goes out, your scopes are broken, you got to figure it out. And sometimes your, your, your patient pool can be less interesting or less complex depending on the kind of practice that you have. You're not doing research or your research opportunities are limited, although there are private practitioners who do clinical research. There's no safety net. You can't work, you're out of work. Nobody else is there to produce revenue for you. And then you also may not be able to work with residents and you may not have the academic sort of aspect to practice that is so engaging for a lot of us in, in urology. So 53% of urologists are in some type of private practice. That's of 2019, which is down from 60% in 2017. And I suspect that since COVID, that number is gonna go down even more. So fewer and fewer urologists are actually opting to go into private practice. There are 13,000 private practice urologists in the United States of whom uh, about 1,200, between 12 and 1,300 are female. 40% of urology residents go on to fellowship training and the most popular fellowships are oncology, endourology, and pediatrics. The largest private urology group in the United States is New Jersey Urology. There are 155 providers at 66 locations. 
Uh, IMP, which is um, the, one of the largest groups, or if not the largest group in New York, has 76 providers and 40 locations. So you can see that private practice groups can be enormous. They really can, can um, you know, way supersede what goes on in hospitals. So the private practice models that are out there for urology fall into sort of these five categories. There are solo practice like what I have. There are urology groups like which I, the one I, that I was in. And those two categories are entrepreneurial. Those categories are practices in which business is a big, big part of the day-to-day -day activity of the urologist. So entrepreneurial is good if you're interested in business and you enjoy business, it can also be stressful and overwhelming if it's really not something that you particularly enjoy dealing with. Once you cross into the multi-specialty group, it now is a corporation. You are no longer working for a group of guys or group of women or yourself. You're now working for a corporation, which has certain benefits and certain drawbacks. And the models, corporate models in private practice are multi-specialty groups, a large urology group practice, or a private equity group, which is sort of this new entity that's been around for maybe the past five or six years that's becoming a bigger presence within urology and something that I think that everybody who's involved in really has to know what that means, especially Younger urologists, as they come out, they have to be aware of who, if they're working for a private equity group, a large urology group practice, or a multi-specialty group. So the solo model we sort of went into, right? That's the most entre entrepreneurial option. It's expensive. There's full exposure financially. Whatever debt is on the business is your debt. Nobody has your back, you're on your own in every way. So your medical decisions are your own, your financial decisions are your own. But there's a big upside because everything you make is yours. You get the good, you get the bad, and you also get the money. You can build something that you may be able to sell. So it's a startup, right? And sometimes those can be very valuable. You can't get fired, you don't have a boss, and you have complete autonomy to, to pursue creative and business opportunities, which is why I've been able to do the things that I've been able to do, because I've been willing to take on the financial exposure, um, because I made the decision personally that I'm, I want to pursue these areas within the, the practice that I have to make it not only more interesting, but also more valuable for patients. So the private practice group model is the next step. So in this model, a group of urologists, two, three, four, five, will join. And the main motivation is to share overhead and reduce expenses. So because you're working with a group, you have less autonomy. Decisions are going to be made as a group. And not everybody is necessarily going to agree on everything. People have schedules, vacation times, interests in how they want to make, how they want to uh, spend money, and these are decisions that are made as a group. And sometimes you're going to have to compromise for the betterment of the group. But you have less exposure financially. You have partners who can back you up, so they can help you with medical decisions. They can help in the OR. Um, they can help in areas that you may not be that interested in. So if you're, you know, the, the guy who does, you know, infertility, but you're not interested in process, you know, dealing with prostate cancer patients, you can work within the group to share within specialties. And also you can cover each other, sickness, maternity leave, paternity leave, vacation time. So when somebody, one person isn't there, somebody else is there to continue generating revenue. There's also a collaborative exploration of new technology and business opportunities. So you can make decisions together about whether purchasing something that may have a high, high cost is gonna be worth it and whether there's gonna be a, a decent return on that investment. And as a result, those ancillary investments like surgery centers, radiology, or pathology can be very lucrative to the group, help you practice better because all that is, is under the control of the urologist and the revenue will stay within the practice. The problem is these groups can get too big. And if they get big, there's not only competition among the group, 
there are disagreements, more personalities, the more likelihood <clears throat> that you're gonna disagree. In my opinion, I was in a group up to 10 and I thought 10 was too many. Uh, people can hide in 10. Some people, some of the urologists will work harder than others. You know, the older guys can be a little bit harder on the younger guys. And the guys that start the practice and have put the money and the effort in feel that they deserve more at the end. And so sometimes these groups can get a little bit, you know, a little clunky, a little too big. And so when that happens, it doesn't work out so well. So groups between six and nine are really ideal. <clears throat> Now we're moving into the corporate models. And these models are private practice models, which means these are owned by private for-profit entities. Somebody owns this. It's owned privately, not by the government and not by a hospital system. The idea of a multi-specialty group is that different, the, the most common sort of platform is where the the primary care specialties or the primary care areas like primary care medicine, pediatrics, OBGYN will be the sort of the base of the practice. And they will then refer to the specialists like orthopedics, um, ENT, and urology. They'll also have specialties within medicine like cardiology and GI that are high reimbursed procedure oriented areas. And so the base private, uh, the, the basic uh, primary care specialties will refer to the specialists who generate revenue through procedures. They can leverage the group for better commercial payments because they can say, you know, we are going to get more, we want more money for our, our primary care so that we can then you know, we can then feed up the ladder, but we're willing to take a little bit less for our specialists in order to bring our primary care up. And so they leverage everybody's sort of, everybody's area of expertise in order for the benefit of the whole group. These are highly corporate administrative structures with, with CEOs, CMOs, CFOs, various administrators who manage the medical arm. And so as a urologist, you are gonna have a non-medical boss. You are no longer on the, under the direction of a urologist, unless the CEO happens to be a urologist, most of the time they are not urologists. And so you are gonna be directed by an administrator, or administrative or corporate arm. And because you are now being governed by an administrative arm, you are now a provider and you're a cost center. So each provider is going to have, a, you know, whatever they need with MAs, scribes, secretaries, equipment, and they are going to cost a certain amount of money to this administrative entity. And sometimes they're expensive. Urologists are definitely more expensive than nurse practitioners and PAs. And so you become somewhat interchangeable in certain ways with a nurse practitioner because there's cost containment. And so you wanna, they wanna keep their costs down. So your autonomy is lost because you are being sort of structured into this larger entity. So the medical care is more autonomous. You fit into the structure that they want. You have a template that they will fill for you and you will have the support staff that they feel that you need. It's much harder to adapt to new ideas in a structure like this because you have to go up the chain of people who often don't understand the work you do to get new things and innovative things going. So it takes longer and it's more onerous to be able to adapt to new, new concepts within medicine. The good thing about a multi-specialty group is the referrals come within. You don't have to work that hard at it because you, the, the, the primary care specialties are gonna refer within the group to you. So you don't have to work so hard and it's easier to collaborate so that you have a, the same EMR, you can um, get all your results from whatever you need from any specialist or any primary care doctor is available to you because you have this sort of this uniform platform. Um, also, you can refer, so if you need an endocrinologist or you need a dermatologist, they're within your, your multi-specialty group. So it's much easier to be able to refer directly to those specialists. And the compensation is rigid. Generally, there's a 
there's a base salary, there's a bonus structure, there's medical benefits, retirement benefits. So you kind of know what you're getting into. If it's a benign multi-specialty group, it works really nicely. If it's not such a benign multi-specialty group and they're not so nice, um, it can be difficult. It can be a difficult structure to work within. Next is um, the large urology group practice. So we're now moving up into the more complicated private practice models. So large urology group practices are urologists who have come together. Some of them are solo, some of them are four or five person urology groups that consolidate into 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 urologists all working together under the same administrative or management umbrella. And there are two reasons why these urologists have consolidated their practices. One is to purchase high revenue generating and expensive ancillary services like lithotripsy machines, radiation to, pro to provide radiation services, CAT scanners, and surgical centers. And the second is to negotiate as a block with commercial player, payers. Um, government payers are fairly, fairly fixed. So Medicare pays what Medicare pays. Medicaid pretty much pays what Medicaid pays. So those are not really negotiable, but the commercial payers are. And so if you have a large group of urologists who are serving a population in which there is not much, not another game in town, they can negotiate more with, with a lot more power with the commercial payers so their reimbursements are higher. And with higher reimbursements, obviously, your bottom line is going to be a lot better. And this is a very, very structured, also corporate structure with a strong administrative arm. So um, these groups are, are, they also have CFOs and CMOs and medical directors because it's such a big group and they're operating under one umbrella then, and I don't know if they will operate under one tax ID, I'm not sure about that, but they have to have a, a strong corporate structure to keep all the urologists sort of in the same lane so that they can be managed. They um, collaborate with other large urology groups to change national healthcare policy. So these groups have become so powerful now that they will go to Washington, their organization called the Large Urology Group Practice Association will go to Washington and advocate for uh, reimbursements and compensation for urologists. What's different about this model versus a multi-specialty model is urologists are often involved in the management. And in some of these uh, large urology groups, the original consolidators, the urologists that started to consolidate the practice or practices are often involved in management and are, are management. They are running the groups. So the fact that the urologist is running the group or very involved in the management of the group and the medical directors are almost are always urologists means that the urologist is well represented because that's the only specialty or the main specialty within the group. Um, and But the administrative arm manages the group. So it is run by administrators. Um, the, each urologist has very little autonomy. Some of these groups have these pods where you work within a pod. And so there's some semblance of autonomy within the pod. But in general, the groups are meant to maximize compensation. And the way they do it is they silo care. So the, radio, you know, the, the, the robotics people do robot, they try and get people to do their specialty. So if you're a robotics person, you do robotics. If you do female, you, everyone sends their female to you. And if you're a young guy coming out of fellowship with robotic training, but you're not hired for that, you're not going to be doing that. And some urologists are office urologists. They're going to be referring all their procedures out. So they try and silo the care in order to capture the most efficient and effective and get the best results um, from their from their, in their group. These groups are under the microscope. They are followed very closely by uh, government agencies because they're so big and they have such a presence, complication rates, uh, infection rates, 
problems within these groups are sort of magnified. And so they maintain tremendous control on how they practice. And many of them insure them, they have their own malpractice insurance. They have, they insure themselves. So they're almost like these freestanding urology entities. Um, they centralize a lot of their care that it's guideline based. So prostate biopsies, they're special, you know, they have rules and regulations on how those patients are properly medicated in, and, and how they're going to go from, you know, transrectals, they're now going to start doing perineal biopsies. And so the group follows what the guidelines of the medical director are. So as a result, there's less room for creativity because it's harder to be creative when you're dealing with a very large structure. Um, the compensation is through salary and revenue share of ancillary services. And the revenue shares are big. In some cases, 50% of compensation is all through ancillary services. And to sort of, sort of bring that point home, you can double your income with the ancillary services. And that's a very, very big driver of this. It is a highly, highly um, well compensated model. Um, and the benefits are corporate style. So they can also offer benefits for health insurance and for retirement because it's across a very large group of, of highly compensated doctors. And these groups are positioning themselves, many of them to be purchased by larger entities if they haven't been already. And each, so large urology group practices did not really exist when I started. Um, Multi-specialty groups did, but not large urology groups. And then this last model really didn't exist until very recently. And this is the last um, private practice model right now that's out there. So this is private equity or private equity owned. So the way this works is investors, guys who have a lot of money, usually they're run by like a charismatic person, one single guy, usually guys, own the private equity group. They take money from investors and they quote unquote partner with practices to increase revenue and prepare the practice to be sold. So private equity groups are in the business of making money and they're looking for ways of making money that are above and beyond the stock market or real, other, like standard real estate. They're looking for innovative ways of making money that is gonna be much faster. They wanna make money fast and they wanna make a lot of it. And so pri private practice groups that produce procedures and are procedure oriented are a target of this group of investors. So what they do is they go into a practice, they promise high returns for reorganization of the practice for future sale. So they say to the, do the doctors involved, we're going to take over your practice, we're going to partner with you. Everybody takes a reduction in salary, so we have more capital so that we can make this a more productive place, we can show a bigger profit, and then we're gonna sell it to the next person. So the areas of medicine that they're most interested in are the ones that generate a lot of money, right? That's anesthesia, dermatology, pain management, and urology, and ophthalmology. So these are all procedure oriented because procedures generate revenue. So in order for them to be able to get that money that they want, that 20, they want to get 20% of, 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 of their ret of return on their investment, they have to do two things. They have to increase their, the, the revenue of the group or reduce overhead. So they have to increase collections or they have to reduce overhead. So the way they can do it is increasing collections is very hard. I mean, you can try and negotiate with payers, which they will do. You can't negotiate with the government, but you can reduce overhead. And that's what they do. So they come in and they slash and burn all the services. So 
you need one, you need two MAs, you got one MA. You have a nurse practitioner, you can use a, a, a an, you know, you can use a medical assistant. You have five secretaries, you can work with two secretaries. They reduce the overhead as much as they can. You see 30 patients a day, you can see 50 patients a day because that's the only way we're going to increase collections. They have purchased physicians as a work product. The commodity that they have purchased is healthcare and the healthcare is generated by the physician. So as a physician, you have to work harder to generate more money and you have lower, you have lower, uh, you have less help because they got a lower overhead. So the problem with that is that you lose control of your practice. You lose control of your ability to, to monitor how you can practice but you still have the same liability. So if you're seeing 50 patients a day, you don't have the same help you used to have. You have to answer all the, the phone calls and you have to make sure that you've checked all your PSAs and you don't have the help you have and you miss something, that's still your problem. You're the one that's liable, it's your medical practice. They cannot, they cannot take over the practice of medicine. So it becomes a quite, um, stressful situation. And the reason that doctors are buying into this is because they are promised big returns. And there's a very complex way that the investor comes in and does a whole assessment of the group and how much they're going to pay up front. But what they're going to do is promise the money is going to come in five years or three years or six years or when it's determined when, when they can resell it to a larger entity. A larger entity is a hospital system or another private equity group. So doctors are taking a little bit of money to start. They're getting a reduction in salary for the and they're going to work their tails off with the hope that this is going to get sold to somebody else for more money and they're going to get their return. So for those of you who watch Billions, Bobby Axelrod is your boss. That's who you're gonna work for if you sell to private equity. So if you work for a private equity company and you as a young urologist are coming into practice, you have to know who you are working for because these guys are going to work you until they can sell you. So from, in my opinion, this is a very precarious model for physicians. Selling or joining a group run by private equity is becoming an indentured servant because they're going to purchase you and sell you to the highest bidder while you're retaining all the liability, losing control, no autonomy, no creativity because they do not want to spend money. They want to make money. So getting back to basics, what if you decide you're looking at all this, you're like, you know what? I kind of like the idea of a solo practice. Like, what does that mean? What, 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 what can I, can I actually do that? So the first thing is you want to look at your intangibles. What, what does, what do you sort of have to think about? And then how do you actually go about doing it? So the intangibles are the low, you have to figure out what location is going to work. You have to find a location where, if, or, and, and you have to see if your family situation will allow you to be in a location where you can actually work, get hospital privileges or work in a surgical center. If you're in an area where you cannot get hospital privileges, if you are not part of the hospital, then you can't set up a solo practice there. You're going to have to go somewhere else, or you can work at a surgical center, but you'd have to give up the ability to do cases that need a hospital. You want to be in a place where payers will admit you, where, where commercial insurance insurers will, will allow you to join their panels where there is an insured population and there's a referral network. So you wanna find a location that is somewhat agreeable to having a, a private practice per solo practitioner. You have to have the confidence to function autonomously because you're gonna be on your own. You have to make decisions on your own. You have to see patients on your own. You have to make medical decisions on your own. I think it's a really hard thing to do at a residency. I usually recommend five years to really get your feet wet hone your skills, know your, your style of practice, understand what you're good at, what you enjoy doing, and then you would have the confidence to stand on your own and practice on your own. You have to have the personality for it. Every patient's a marketing opportunity. You have to be cheerful, affable, approachable, available. You can't be in a bad mood. You can't be tired. You know, if your dog is sick, patients can't know about it. You can't be late. 
Um, any bad experience can go up online and that will really affect your ability to practice. And you have, to have, you have to have the temperament to run a business. You, you have to manage employees. If you're nasty or angry or lash out at your staff, they're going to quit and you got to replace them and it's expensive. So you really have to have the temperament to be able to manage the office. And every opportunity that you have is networking and marketing for your business. So the basics, the, the sort of the, what is that? Six steps to setting up a practice. It's very basic. You have a business plan. I learned how to do it online. I developed a business plan and I got a half a million dollar build out loan from Chase Bank. I walked in and I got a half a million dollar build out loan. You incorporate, which is done through an accountant. You find a location, you sign a lease, you credential with the payers. You set up a marketing plan and develop a digital presence of a website of some sort. You buy equipment, you hire a staff and you're ready. You're in business, you're in practice. So the most important question that you have to answer when you are looking at private practices is, is who do you work for? Do you work for a urology group? Is it a multi-specialty group? Are you working for a large urology group or are you working for a private equity firm? It's very important, especially when you're young because you are the work, we are the workhorses of the practice, who you're gonna work for. That's the most important thing. It's also important when you're working in a smaller group, you wanna know the kind of doctors they are, about retention of staff, about how well everybody gets along. You really have to understand who the structure, what's the structure of this group? Who's running the group? Are you working directly for them? Are you working for a, you know, an administrator or a, 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 a manager? That's the question you wanna ask. When you go into an interview, you wanna know who, am I working for? And most importantly is figure out what you want in your practice. What is important to you in terms of, of location, money, practice style, autonomy, creativity? Um, what is it that you want out of the practice? And then you see which model is gonna work best for you. What's most important for me is to know that private practice is, is extremely rewarding. Good medicine can be practiced. Um, we can do good and we can also do well. You can practice good medicine and you can keep the money that you earn. The commodity that we've spent so many years developing is our, is our work, right? The work product is what we have to offer and it should not be sold for cheap. It should be it should be yours and you hold on to it and you make sure that you can control it because you can, nobody should be able to take that away from you. And I think that a lot of us don't recognize how powerful we are as doctors because without us, there is no revenue. Without the doctor, there's no revenue. So that's a very general overview of what's out there in private practice and what the models are. So, um, I, you know, I didn't get too granular because it's a, it's a huge, huge topic, but I'm happy to answer any questions um, that anybody has. Thank you so much, Dr. Cavalier. That was, uh, that was incredible, um, really comprehensive talk. Um, I'm just waiting for some questions to come in, uh, but I, I came up with one on my own, um, but I, I guess we'll start with, um, if you were, you know, coming out of residency today um, and you're thinking private practice, what, um, which one of those models would you go for? So if I had my choice of anything, there, there are two things I would do. One is I would want to join a group, a private group of, of six or seven or eight people um, who need me. Either somebody's retiring, they're taking on a new location, and there's an, there's an a need for another urologist. So the idea of a urology group is very appealing. Or surprisingly enough, I would consider going into the hospital for a short time, but your contract has to be very short without a non-compete. Because I think it's really important that when you start, you're in an environment where you're gonna have support. So you have help to learn and, you, and to grow and to stretch your wings, you know, spread your wings. But I also think you wanna get paid well you should be compensated fairly. 
what I like about urology groups is that they've been there, right? These are, these are people who started out like you did and they relate to you well. The advantage of working in a, in a hospital when you're young is the obvious, right? You have the support, you have the residents, it's sort of a, a way to kind of hone your skills. The problem with the hospitals is that they, for, they're, so, they're so malignant in how they hold you. They won't let you go and you should be able to leave. I have had other doctors work with me. I have no non-compete. There should never be a non-compete in urology because there's so many patients and there aren't enough urologists. So I think that the hospital is not bad to start in as long as you, you are not gonna be um, too tethered. So you can't leave, like it's Hotel California, right? Once you sign, you can't get out. So that's the problem with the hospital, but a, a, a urology group that doesn't have an onerous non-compete is, is the best way to start. Great, great. Um, so the second question uh, we have is, um, what are your thoughts about uh, switching between um, private practice and the academic world? Or at, let's say you, you start off in academics and, and you, you wanna switch to private practice. Um, I, think, I think a lot of uh, people have the impression that it's quite difficult to do so. You mean to switch or just to start a private practice, just to open a private practice? Well, let's say uh, you come out and, you know, you join an academic practice. Um, how difficult is it to, you know, let's say 10, 10 years out mm -hmm. to switch right. to private practice? Is that, is that really difficult or? No, it's not difficult at all. It's actually private practice, even solo private practice. It's not that difficult to start because we have the internet, right? So the internet is the greatest thing because all you have to do is put up a website and people will find you. So you don't even need a referral base. You can go to another state, you can go to another city and you can, or, or even a rural area and you can open up a practice without needing a tremendous amount of support because people will find you since urology is such an underserved specialty. They're just, it really, I don't think that a lot of the younger urologists out there realize what a, what, where we are in terms of workforce. We don't have enough urologists. So if you want to get out and, and open, you know, basically put up a shingle, there, that's what I did. And there's almost nowhere that you won't be able to build a practice. Because if you try, I mean, where I am, I have huge hospitals around me. I have, you know, Cornell and Columbia is right down the block and NYU and Mount Sinai and even Montefiore. And yet I'm extremely busy because the hospitals are so inefficient. If you call the hospital, you can't get an appointment for three months. You can come and see me, you know, I'll have an opening tomorrow. We have an, you know, we have an opening tomorrow. You can come in tomorrow. We have a list of people waiting, but I have a staff here who does that. So it's much more nimble. So you can build so quickly by just being available as a result of the refugees from the hospital. And that's true anywhere that you go. So starting a private practice is not that hard. It's not really that hard. It, it's, I think there's a sense that it's so overwhelming, but nobody opens up a private practice and has like, a, you know, the, all these things that they do. It's one step at a time. You start with like, you know, a, a cystoscope that you, you pay by, you know, time. You start with an office and you mean lots of people start with one office and one exam room that they rent and then they move up into bigger spaces. So you start very small and you work your way up because once you have a patient and once you generate a bill, which also the other thing is EMR, it makes it so much simpler. You can do your own billing. You can send your own claims. It's not that hard to do. And then you have a business and you build on it. And before you know it, you have too many patients. You don't even know what to do with them. So you got to hire somebody to help you with your billing. Then you got to hire somebody to answer your phones. Um, so it's not hard. I think it's conceptually hard. It's like, how do you become a urologist? Well, you don't wake up as a urologist. You got to go to college, medical school, residency, you know, and as you go through each step, you get there. And What's so frustrating to me is to see so many people sell themselves short because they're afraid. There's nothing to be afraid of. The biggest barrier are the loans, right? The biggest barrier is if you have 400,000 or $300,000 in loans, you gotta pay those back, right? And that's tough when you're young to take on, I mean, you, you'll pay them back. If you go into private practice, you'll pay them back. But if you can take on a job where they'll, they're a loan, forgiveness programs, and you can do that for four or five years while you're honing your skills, 
that's that's an important consideration. But if that's not your issue, you know, you you open you you can do it. Um, if you have a lot of responsibilities within your family and your partner is not working, that can be difficult too because you're going to not get money for a couple of months until things start to roll in. And so, um, I mean, just just to kind of segue a little bit, but. Um, I guess with the, the way that we answered that question was if you wanted to start your own practice, but do you think that there's any difficulty, you know, going from academics to, let's say you want to, you want to join a practice and, you know, become a partner in a practice like that already exists or, or is that not a problem as well? No, it's totally possible. The only problem is, I mean, no, I think lots of people have done that. And the, the, the issue is that when, you know, it's a, there, there are different models of how it's done. And, and if you're a, if you've been in practice for 10 years and you decide you want to go into private practice and there's a group that you want to join, you're not going to start at the bottom of the group, right? If you're young and you're joining, you're going to start, you know, with whatever you're going to start with and they're going to work you up the ladder. But if you are coming in there with 10 years of experience, you may take a pay cut because you're not going to get necessarily what you get at the hospital, but your upside will be much greater very quickly. So you move into the private, the private group, your practice is the same, right? When you practice in the hospital, it's all RBU based and productivity generated anyway, right? So you're in a position to have to generate a certain amount of money. So the pressures aren't any different. The difference is when you move into a private practice and it's a more efficient system and the staff works for you and they perform for you the way you need, you're able to generate money faster and easier. So actually, I think it's much easier to go from academics into private practice than private practice into academics. Okay. I, I could not at this point work in a hospital. I, I would like shoot myself. You know, <laughs> I, I just can't deal with the inefficiencies because yeah. I don't have that here. So I don't think it's hard. Because, and you know, the, the re, one of the big reasons is because academics is not really academic unless you're doing what the people last week are doing, which is research. But if you're right. working in a hospital and having to, you know, hustle and generate revenue, you know, what's the difference? Right, right. Except you're not giving all your money to the hospital. Right. Right. Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and this kind of, uh, I guess, uh, kind of a segue into the next question that came up is, um, you know, you, you kind of alluded to this earlier, but um, in terms of uh, selling yourself short, um, what are some common pitfalls that you see, like, you know, people graduating from residency make in terms of job selection? And, you know, um, the, and there's a second part to that question, which is that um, should somebody accept a job knowing that it's, you know, it's a starter position and they're probably going to leave at some point anyway? Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I, I don't think that when you're coming out of residency or fellowship, you should necessarily have, you know, only you, you, this job is your job for life. There, you can move. Um, I don't think you ever look at a job as if like, well, I don't know if I really want to do this, but I'm just going to take it. I think you look at what the benefits of the job are. And when you're right out of your residency or fellowship, what your needs are going to be different than what they are five years in, 10 years in, 15 years in. So, um, you know, I don't, I, I think that when you, when you first start the pitfalls, first of all, the money is a distraction. And I feel that too much emphasis is put on what you get when you sign. It isn't where you start. It's where you're going. It's your opportunity. How can I grow? And what does that mean? So where am I getting my, where's my office? So if you have a job and there's nowhere for you to have a computer and a telephone because there, there's just no space for you, there's no, that's no good. If they don't have room for you to see patients, if they don't, if the secretaries don't know who you are, if the MAs don't know who you are, you must have opportunity. If they're paying you $500,000 a year and you have no opportunity to grow and develop, you're not only going to be out of a job, but you're going to be miserable. So the money becomes such a big focus that you lose sight of what's really important, which is growing the business, because that's what you will own when you leave. You'll own the skills and, and, the, and maybe the patience that you've built, the practice that you've built during that time. So that's what I think is most important. You do want money and you do want to be treated with respect financially, but you're better off taking less money with incentives and a very good opportunity. And that's what you really want to look at. 
That's great advice, Dr. Kevler. Um, and if they've hired three other urologists out of residency at the same time, that's not good, mm -hmm. right? You don't so, want to be the, you know, like you, you don't want to, you don't want that. You got to make sure that they're serious. They're not going to see like which of the three of you is going to be successful. That's not an investment in you. Yeah. More like, uh, sounds more like manipulation. Uh. Right, right. Or they just throw everything against the wall and they'll see who, you know, who makes it or, you know, and, and, right. and you don't want that. Yeah, you don't want that. Um, and our last question uh, was uh, about research. Uh, so in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of those models, uh, which, which model would you say um, does the most research? I mean, I, I know that I, I've seen some articles um, that have been published by some large urology groups, but um, I don't really know. I mean, I don't really know what the dynamics of that are. Like, are small groups doing any research? Is that something that- Well, yeah, I mean, there's a whole business in research. Clinical trials are big industry and there's a lot of money that can be generated through it. And there's also papers that can be published. It's a little, you know, it depends on, it's a little, it's a little sort of, I don't know. The value is sort of questionable, but a lot of groups will have a clinical, you know, nurse who deals with the data management of these of these clinical trials, and they have a whole clinical trial arm, and it can be, it can be interesting because you'll, you know, you, you'll you can, you know, develop new ideas and new techniques, and it can be of course, remunerative because you get paid a lot of money to do these trials by pharmaceutical companies and then they publish. So a lot of these articles will be, a lot of these re research results will be published and then you can become a speaker for the product. And so then you can make money that way. So if you call that research, you have those opportunities and that's there. You can also, you, you can be involved in the fellowship. I mean, for the time that I was with New York Urological, I was involved in the fellowship with um, New York Hospital in, in female pelvic medicine for like 10 years. So I was part of the fellowship. I had fellows with me. I had residents. Um, I was the, doing the, I was running the urogynecology in the GYN department at Lenox Hill. So you, there are many private practices that have sort of academic affiliations and often will get paid by the hospital. They'll get actually income from the hospital to provide certain services to the hospital, including teaching and research. Mm -hmm. It's interesting how things have sort of, the middle is getting closer between private practice and academics or hospital-based because a lot of academic groups can have sort of this hospital-based connection and arm. And then a lot of hospital groups are sort of under the revenue producing pressures of a private practice. So things are sort of merging. And that's why I think it's when you, when you go to look at a private group, you do, again, who do you work for? Is the hospital kicking in money? Uh, you know, where is the money coming in for me to be here? And you want to know that you should ask all that. You, you're, you have to ask the questions that are, are good, that you have to know who, who you're working for, who are you answering to, and what are those opportunities that are gonna make you, help you grow into the kind of urologist you wanna be. That's great, That's great advice, Dr. Kellogg. Um, And you kind of alluded to something that I was kind of wanted to ask you. Um, I think I might have asked you off the record before, but you know, um, in terms of fellowships, like uh, I, I, I know that the demand is pretty high for general urology, but do you, like, what are your thoughts on, on fellowships? Is that something that people yeah, pursue so, or really? Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's a really tough position to put young people in now because you guys are coming out with a lot of debt. You're coming out into an uncertain world. And we're asking you after five years or six years to do another year or two of indentured servitude. And it's not fair because you're not gonna get that much out of most fellowships. Most fellowships are not that valuable because you're, you're gonna be well enough trained in, in the high, technical fields because we don't need those. You know, we don't need that many robotic surgeons. We don't need that many, you know, urethral reconstructive urologists. We don't need gender reassignment urologists. There's not that much of that out there. So you can do an extra year or two of a fellowship making not a lot of money, you know, doing kind of the same old thing you were doing when you were a resident. And you really don't have a skill set that's really that much more valuable. Your skill set is in being a good person, practicing good medicine, you know, doing basic urology, seeing patients, that's where, what we need. 
that's what we need. We need urologists who do basic urology. We don't need another robotic surgeon, but everybody wants to do robotic fellowships. It's not going to, and, and it's not, when you go into private practice, yeah. after you realize that surgery is a hobby, right? That's what we all say. Surgery is a hobby. You don't get paid for it. At some point, you may have done this fellowship and realize you don't even want to be doing this anymore. So I think you really have to think about what the fellowship is going to offer you. But uh, in terms of like, let's say marketing and, you know, getting a, getting a specific job, let's say like a location you want. You it doesn't matter. Okay. Nobody cares. They can hire you to do the infertility and never, you know, you don't know anything about infertility. You get hired by a group. They're like, we need somebody to do infertility. And you go, you know what? That's interesting to me. It's also highly lucrative. So, you know, you can you know, do a testis biopsy. You can learn, you know, you can learn how to do varicose microscopic. Most people can do micro you know, microscopic varicose electomies. You, you have the basic skills. You can learn the rest of the skills. And it's all you, pra you learn by practicing. The same thing mm -hmm. with with most urology, even if they need somebody to do female and you're not doing major prolapse surgery, but you can do a sling, you know how to do your dynamics, you can do Botox, you can do stimulators. You have 90% of what you need to be a competent, to, to competently treat most of the women you're going to see. You don't need more than that. We don't need people to be doing robotic sacral culprapexies. We've got plenty of people doing that. So I don't think in terms of, of marketing, patients have, you know, they don't know. They just know who's good. But there are plenty of urologists out there who have not, especially in private practice, who have not done fellowships, who do more slings than any female urology in any academic center, and they have never done a fellowship, and they're better at them. And just so you got to get out there and them. get to work. You want to get out there and get to work and practice and treat patients because we need we need urologists. Okay, okay, that's that's all great advice. Thanks so much. Um, Thank I think, you. Uh, Thanks for asking I think, me to do this. I think our time is almost up, but um, for everybody uh, that was here and listening, uh, please watch out for the uh, CMA survey. Um, you know, we'll be sending that out tomorrow, and uh, you know, we'll of course post this on YouTube for uh, future viewing. And uh, once again, thank you so much, Dr. Kaler. Great. Thanks, Akil. Take care. Take care.